Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Today we're checking out facts about Winston Churchill. Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from October 1951 through April 1955. And although it may be what he is most famous for, he was much more than the British Bulldog who held Britain together during the Blitz. So, today we're going to take a look at some of the facts about the one, the only, Winston Churchill. Okay, let's hear more about the man who said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Oh, I like that. I just watched a video about Dunkirk, and I think the way he handled it was pretty impressive. I'm interested to learn more about him. A premonition he would save 1891, London. 1891, and... a 17-year-old Winston Churchill prophetically told a school friend, I can see vast changes coming over a now peaceful world. The young Churchill predicted great upheavals and terrible struggles in the future, wow. declaring the world would face wars such as one cannot imagine. Now, keep in mind this was decades before two world wars threatened Britain. Amazingly, Churchill even predicted, I tell you London will be in danger, London will be attacked, and I shall be very prominent in the defense of London. Wow, 50 years what? later, Churchill would lead Britain during the dark days of the London Blitz, when Germany's planes dropped explosives on the city. Churchill's friend responded, how can you talk like that? And added, we are forever safe from invasion since the days of Napoleon. I remember before September 11th, 2001, having a similar idea about the United States, that no one would ever attack us on our homeland. That would be so dumb of them. But they found a way to do it. It probably seemed like a reasonable response at the time, but ooh-wee, talk about being wrong. Churchill wow. told his friend, I see further ahead than you do. I see into the future. This country will be subjected somehow to a tremendous invasion. And I shall be in command of the defenses of London, and I shall save London and England from disaster. He said ooh -wee. that? Talk about being right. What? That cannot be real. Is that real? Was he psychic? Was that the only permanent? Oh, look, during the Blitz Churchill Act. Oh my God, this is crazy. I've never heard that before, that he had premonitions. That's fascinating. I gotta look, I gotta, I need another source. Wow, it looks like that's a well-known fact that he predicted these things. No wonder he knew what to do and what to say. What an advantage. I bet Hitler couldn't do that. Wow. He'll be very prominent in the defense of London. 50 wow. years later, Churchill would lead Britain during the dark days. <laughs> He must have sounded like such a cocky bastard <laughs> when he said that to his friend. During the Blitz, the Luftwaffe dropped 9,000 incendiary devices on London. And thanks to Churchill's 9, instincts, 000. the kitchen staff at 10 Downing Street survived one. On October 14, 1940, Churchill and his wife, Clementine, hosted a dinner at the Prime Minister's residence during an air raid. The Blitz began as usual, Clementine later wrote. But the party went on, and the cook and maid continued working in the kitchen next to a 25-foot-high plate glass window. But suddenly, Churchill jumped up and ordered the kitchen staff to head for the bomb shelter. Put dinner on a hot plate in the dining room, Churchill told his butler. Only three minutes afterward, Churchill later wrote, the dinner party heard a really loud crash close at hand, and a violent shock showed wow. that the house had been struck. A nearby detonation had completely destroyed the kitchen and pantry. Churchill's quick thinking saved the lives of his entire kitchen staff. Wow. Quite a dinner host. Let's yeah. hope he was a good tipper as well. My God. So, first of all, bombs are falling on the city, and Winston Churchill is having a dinner party. I mean, for those people that were at the dinner party, they must have been so amazed at his ability to predict. I mean, what? If I was at a dinner party and Winston Churchill got up and said, get the kitchen staff to the bomb shelter, I would head down to the bomb shelter as well. I would not take a chance. The story of an American girl from New York marrying into the English aristocracy sounds like the plot of a movie, but it's actually the real life story of Winston Churchill's mother. Jenny Jerome was born in Brooklyn in 1854. What? I've never heard of that. Winston Churchill's mom was an American. That's crazy. As a teenager, Jerome met Lord Randolph Churchill at a sailing regatta, where the future King Edward VII introduced the couple. Months no way. later, they married, and Jerome became Lady Randolph Churchill. But Winston's mother did not exactly match the stereotype of a formal Victorian aristocrat. 
For starters, she had a tattoo of a snake awesome. on her left yeah. wrist. She also attended anti-suffrage meetings with her son, Winston, facing down anti-suffrage wrist. She also attended anti-suffrage meetings with her son, Winston. So she didn't want to vote? His mom sounds wild. She also attended anti-suffrage meetings with her son, Winston, That's so strange. facing down the booze of suffragettes. And after her first husband passed, she remarried a man 20 years her junior. Good for her, hey. During the Boer War, Churchill sailed to Cape Town to work as a war correspondent. The young man hadn't expected to see combat. In fact, it was so far from his mind that he brought a liquor cabinet and a valet to the combat. <laughs> but just nice. weeks after arriving in South Africa, Churchill's train was ambushed by Boers. With bullets flying everywhere, the future prime minister organized the British troops on the train so they could escape. But the Boers captured Churchill and took him to a POW camp. Churchill pleaded with his captors to let him go. I am a newspaper correspondent, and you ought not to hold me prisoner. Wow, but the Boers journalist. saw the young man as much more than just your average reporter and replied that we do not catch Lord's sons every day. If they weren't going to let him go, Churchill would arrange for his own release, and he immediately started plotting an escape from prison. One night, he jumped over the fence and ran for it, carrying nothing but four slabs of melting chocolate and a crumbling biscuit. But the <laughs> Boers put a bounty on Churchill's head, offering a reward for his capture, dead or alive. After crossing swamps and sneaking onto trains, Churchill made it back to British territory. I love his priorities of chocolate and a biscuit. I didn't know he was so fearless. I mean, it comes through in his words, but I didn't know he had been to war. I didn't know he had fought in battle. No, he led troops. I didn't know his father was a lord. I didn't know he was psychic. I know he was well known for his speeches, and now it makes a little more sense. He was a journalist, so he had a little more awareness of words and how to relay a message and make it effective. And he was a writer. Most a painter? know that Churchill was a journalist, a soldier, a historian, and a prime minister. However, he was also a prolific painter. What? In 1921, Churchill secretly showed his paintings in a Paris gallery. But rather than sign his own name on his works, Churchill used a pseudonym. At first, he planned to use the name Mr. Spencer, which Churchill had used when seeking to travel incognito to France on munitions business during the war. For whatever reason, Churchill decided not to use the Spencer alias, and ultimately settled on the name Charles Morin. We can only guess as to whether the assumed name helped or hurt sales. But we know that over the course of the gallery show, six of Churchill's paintings were sold. That's a nice painting. Kind of expressionist. Beautiful colors. Good technique. Good lighting. Good shading. He tried to warn Stalin. In 1939, Germany and Russia signed a non-aggression pact. But less than two years later, Hitler plotted to break his word and blindside Stalin. Germany moved over three and a half million soldiers into position on the border of Poland, which the Soviets occupied at the time. Over a 10-day period, the Germans barreled across 300 miles, wiping out more than 40,000 Soviet soldiers each day wow. and bringing 20 million people under the Third Reich's control. Despite the fact he was staunchly anti-communist, Churchill saw the incursion coming and tried to warn Stalin. Months before the sneak really? attack, Churchill sent a secret message to Stalin warning of the strike. Franklin Roosevelt also tried to warn Stalin, but Stalin refused to believe the Fuhrer would wage a two-front war, since that exact scenario doomed the Germans in World War I. In retrospect, Stalin was both wrong and right. The Germans did hmm. indeed attack, and it took a heavy toll on the Russian military. But the attack didn't do much to help Germany either, and was arguably a key turning point in the war just like in World War I. Hmm. In 1927, Churchill visited Italy. According to the New York Times, while on the trip, Britain's Chancellor of the Exchequer expressed approval of the fascist regime and his own admiration of Premier Mussolini, its dictator. It certainly makes for a pretty awkward historical moment in retrospect, <laughs> but why did Churchill did. praise Mussolini in the first place? Yeah. Well, to Churchill, communism was a much greater threat than fascism. He approved of the dictator's authoritarian style for imposing order and discipline. In a letter to his own wife, Churchill wrote, This country gives the impression of discipline, order, goodwill, smiling faces, a happy, strict school. 
Speaking to Mussolini directly on the hmm. visit, Churchill said, If I had been an Italian, I am sure that I should have been wholeheartedly with you. From the start to the finish in your triumphant struggle against the bestial appetites and passions of Leninism. I guess nobody's right all the time. He didn't see that one coming, I guess. He once let offenders burn rather than risk firefighters' lives. In 1911, the siege of Sydney Street erupted when a Latvian gang suspected of slaying three police officers barricaded themselves in an East End building. The police rushed to surround the building, flooding the block with 200 armed men. The Latvians opened fire, triggering a standoff that would eventually pull in Churchill. The police laying siege to the building called to the Tower of London for backup from the army. Churchill, who was home secretary at the time, received the call and sent troops to the siege. In the middle of the gunfight, Churchill decided to personally go to Sydney Street. In these circumstances, Churchill wrote, I thought it my duty to see what was going on myself, and my advisors concurred in the propriety of such a step. But Churchill's actions weren't motivated purely by a sense of duty, saying, I must, however, admit a strong sense of curiosity, which perhaps it would have been well to keep in check. Wearing a top hat and a fur-lined coat, Churchill took control of the siege. But before he could order the police to storm the house, a fire broke out in the building. When a fire brigade appeared to put out the blaze, Churchill ordered them not to intervene, allowing two Latvians to perish in the fire rather than risk the lives uh, of the firefighters. This Latvian gang killed three police officers, and then I guess they're running from the law, and they barricaded themselves in this building. Okay. And then a fire caught, and instead of putting out the fire... He said, let it burn. That's kind of cold hearted, but at the same time, they did already kill three police officers and they were shooting at more, so. Seaplane? Have you ever heard of a seaplane? Well, I guess so. no one did before 1913, because that's when Churchill coined the term. As First <laughs> Lord of the Admiralty from 1911 until 1915, Churchill took a hands on approach to defense. In 1912, Britain authorized a naval wing of the Flying Corps to use planes for harbor, estuary, and coast defense and scouting, according to the Kendall Mercury and Times. The military developed a hydro airplane called Waterbird, Britain's first successful float plane. Churchill, fascinated by the invention, told the House of Commons that the results so far attained have been promising. In addition to supporting Waterbird, Churchill also coined the term seaplane on the spot during a House of Commons hearing in 1913. Hmm. Again, his talent for words comes into play. Seaplane is a better term than Waterbird. After World War I, Churchill opposed harsh retribution against... Okay. The end of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles imposed harsh penalties on Germany demobilizing its army and placing its government in debt for billions of dollars in reparations. Churchill declared the treaty monstrous and malignant. Hmm. That's because Churchill saw an even bigger threat to Britain than Germany. Russia had recently fallen to the Bolsheviks and emerged as a communist power. Demobilizing the German army would mean one less power fighting against communism in Churchill's mind. Ah. I think the day will come when it will be recognized without doubt, Churchill predicted, that the strangling of Bolshevism at its birth would have been an untold blessing to the human race. So he wanted Germany to continue to have the abilities to fight off the communists. That's interesting. I wonder if the repercussions of World War I were not so harsh on Germany if there would have ever been a World War II, because I think part of what made Hitler be Hitler was that he was very disgruntled about World War I. At least that's how I understand it. Maybe I'm wrong. A man went after Churchill with a dog whip. What's a dog whip? Oh, okay. It's like a little whip. Like his admiration of Mussolini, not all of Churchill's political positions seem so enlightened in retrospect. For example, Churchill opposed letting women vote and even ended up in a physical confrontation Ooh. with a passionate suffragist. In 1910, a group of suffragettes held a demonstration demanding Parliament extend the right to vote to women. Police targeted the demonstrators, and some suffragettes blamed Home Secretary Winston Churchill for the vicious tactics. Hugh Franklin, suffragist, confronted Churchill on a train a few weeks after the demonstration. Armed with a dog whip, Franklin yelled, Take this, you cur, for the treatment of the suffragists. Franklin <laughs> ended up in jail for this act, yeah. where he went on a hunger strike to demand women's suffrage. Churchill might have won World War II, but he lost to this one. Women in England would have their right to vote recognized with the passage of the Representation of the People Act in 1918. 
It's surprising to find out that he was against women voting. It must have been all those anti-suffragette meetings he went to with his mom. What was his reasoning? Churchill in his younger years felt that women should not vote, writing in 1875 that they are well represented by their fathers, brothers, and husbands. That's not a good reason. Women are less intelligent, they lack awareness, so they should not be given this responsibility. You'd have to think that maybe he didn't want women to vote because he didn't think women would vote for him. Look at that face. He's up to something. Well, really interesting video. I learned a lot about Winston Churchill I didn't already know. I feel like World War II could have gone a lot different if he was not the prime minister. He was well prepared to handle that. Throughout his whole life, he seemed to find himself in these situations where he had to make tough decisions and he had to be bold and brave. So, in a way, it makes sense. Props to you, Winston Churchill. Except what's about that women voting thing? Huh? What were you thinking? Anyway, great video. Thank you all for recommending. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Later.